For me, collecting is more than a hobby. It's a way of life. To me, there's no greater thrill than the moment when you complete a set or find the one rare piece that has eluded antiquarians for years. I love things. Cards, figures, dolls, puppets, watches. And as my desire to surround myself with material possessions grew, I found that I didn't care for the things so much, but the thrill of collecting them. So, after I'd collected several years worth of goods, it was only natural that the store grew up around me. Little Dreams Antiques. Say you know me from our little chat, and I'll give you a discount on two items of your choice, and we'll both share a good laugh. Where to start, where to start? I'm 50-something years old, set in my ways, and my recent passion has been collecting video games. Not to play. I'm a bit out of the loop when it comes to their stories or art. I've got a hunch that, in the next 20 years, rarer video games will fill the niche that baseball cards seem to create. And with the rare mint games already going for a decent amount on the market, I've been looking at them as sort of a nest egg. Now, my store has achieved something of a reputation of having rare stock on hand. As such, even though I'm located smack in the center of a city, I've got a pretty reliable core of customers. Old friends, if you will. The cream of the crop. I enjoy a good conversation with them, almost as much as knowing that the collectibles I sell will find themselves in good hands. I'd be lying if I said she made it into that inner circle. She was too young. Too young to be an old timer. And bought electronics, almost exclusively. At first, I'd seen her loitering in the back of the store with her grey clothes and her downcast face, and assumed she was one of the gawkers that never bought anything. Turned out, Norma and I shared a taste in classical music, and from there, it was always a delight to hear the chime of the bell as she stepped inside. Of course, Norma wasn't her name. You know that as well as I do. But if it's all the same to you, I'd rather not mention real names. It helps me deal with this one step at a time. Anyway, we... She would occasionally buy pricier items, you know? Things I wouldn't expect a young woman to have a taste in. Furniture, vinyl records... At first, I thought she was doing it to impress on one of those internet click things I hear people talking about on the news. But she had an almost encyclopedic knowledge of most of the stuff she bought. That was the thing that caught my eye. She always paid in cash. Always. Now, that's not too unusual, even for expensive purchases. People who are into antiques tend to be a little... I don't want to use the word distrustful, but that's the word. So I'd watch her take out a hundred dollar bill from her pocket, then another, and another. And we'd exchange it silently. A little ritual, if you will. Of course, it also meant that I didn't know much more about her than what she chose to tell me. And that's where doubt started to scream at me. And I should have just listened. You see, one day, Norma comes into the shop as usual. She just sits there, digging through the pile of older games and electronic equipment I have in the overstock bin. Which means that I had more than one copy, and so the prices were slashed. I ignore her besides a wave to show that I acknowledge her presence. We were both in our own worlds. I actually forgot about her. It was a quiet day at the shop, and I had been thinking of closing up early and grabbing something to eat. Turning around to double check the register, I saw her staring at me. No, not at me, but at the floor. Her eyes would never quite meet mine, or anyone's. Her voice was all wavy like it normally was, but firm, insistent. Don't think I'd ever heard it that unyielding. I want this one. She shoved a cartridge onto the counter. It struck me as funny at the time. The label had right off or gotten peeled off or something. I still had the label, I just hadn't gotten around to retaping it. Some super something world. They all look alike to me. I figured she just wanted it with some sort of label on. So I reached behind the counter for some ticker tape. I remembered her eyes widening in shock, then fury. 
as she knocked the tape from my fingers. No! There was an incredibly awkward pause. Norma was as usual, looking past me, not quite meeting my eyes. I mean, no. Please, I want to purchase it as it is. My gut twisted. This didn't seem right. Perhaps I should have just sold it to her without the damn label. Perhaps that would have been enough. But I didn't. I didn't. Sorry, miss. You can't sell it without a label. You sure you don't want one of the other ones? I tried to sound as kindly as I swept the cartridge behind the counter and covertly shoved it into my coat pocket. But worried that my concern showed. Norma was ignoring my words and grinding her teeth together so loud that I could hear the bones dusting each other. Snip, snap, snip, snap. Like an ice in a blender. Finally, she smiled and said that she didn't need anything else today. Thank you, and then she left. After 30 minutes of shuffling around the store and looking for things to do, I managed to wipe the encounter from my mind and close up shop. I had a good dinner that day. Grilled cheese with fried greens. Black coffee after dinner mint. Sorry. It's weird the sort of things you remember on days like that. You sure it's fine? Okay, alright, I'll keep going. The sky was dark and starless that night. It was beautiful, but lonely. A few people were out panhandling in the night. I didn't have any cash on me, but I gave one of them the rest of my dinner. Yeah, it was a pretty paltry gesture, but I guess my thoughts were elsewhere. For some reason, for some reason, I decided to go check out the shop. The place was a mess. Someone must have gone crazy trying to get in. But the one closed circuit camera I had set up was completely smashed, a heavy rock falling at its side. Barring that, the windows were dented, cracked, but too heavily reinforced to get past. The security measures I had in place to keep the store safe had foiled my burglar. But not for lack of trying. Someone had walked over the roof, walked back down, and done a few laps around the store. A few officers were loitering, taking notes. I asked them about it, but they were tense. I mentioned that I owned the place and assured me that they'd get on it. So I gave up, and feeling exhausted, made my way home. The apartment block I live in isn't particularly luxurious or something. It's like a concrete slab with a garden and a pool hidden somewhere. But that's enough for me. Usually. When I finished walking home, I noticed the super, the building superintendent that is, just milling around, a glum expression on her face. Ma'am? I said respectfully, knowing she'd speak to me if it was something I'd done. Her face turned to mine, and in a split second, I knew my night wasn't over. You've got a package, Mr. Seski. You've got a package, Mr. Seski. I left it by your room. She looked as if she wanted to say more, but she didn't. And hell, I wanted to ask her about it, but you don't live in a place like this and get through by talking to one another. We nodded our heads in that peculiar manner folks do, and hastily parted ways. Three floors up. My room is three floors up, the fourth floor. But you want to know about the package? I'm sorry, just a second. Please. All right, there was a letter from Norma at the front door. Pink, cherry pink writing, chalk, maybe crayon. It seemed out of character for her. Not that I knew much about her besides the fact that she bought my store. Lots of formal, elegant writing and talking about the weather, asking how I was doing, that sort of thing. But the letter didn't end. I know you think I'm exaggerating, but it literally did not end. As I unfolded the letter, I realized that the package wasn't a package. It was page upon page of writing, folded neatly into itself. There must have been enough paper there to be a small novel. But by the 23rd page, it started to fade into meaninglessness. 
Norma's once steady handwriting started to swivel, grow bizarre and rambling. She repeated that I had to give her the game, that it was important, but not once in the whole hundreds of pages did she say why. I know. I read it twice. At some point, the crayon, chalk or powdery substance she used must have given out, and she switched to a different shade. Something rustier, kind of deep brown. By then, she'd just taken to writing the word game over and over again. I felt nauseous. Now, I'd taken the message inside to read it, of course. So I set it up on my bed, turned my computer on, and checked the website and updated with the information that I'd be closed for the next few days to deal with repairs. And then, I noticed something else. My inbox was completely full. I confess. I confess. I didn't read a single email. I contacted my internet provider immediately, explained my problem and maybe due to my age or my authoritative voice, managed to get the guy on the other side of the phone to give me an address. At that point, I should have just phoned the police. I should have. I know. But I didn't. And it's on my head. I was concerned. And a little surprised to find out that Norma lived in a block I'd heard been condemned some time back. Worst of all, I was curious. The same curiosity that made me want to collect things whispered like a demon in the back of my mind. Take a look. It won't hurt you. Take a look. What's going on here? I had to look. I had to go and see for myself. So I did. The yard, again, not the name of the complex, though I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, had long since been condemned. But, it appears I'd missed the place being refurbished a year and a half back. A few squatters and early buyers had moved in, and it looked like they'd gotten a good start on the place. Yeah, I hear it isn't half bad of a place to live right now. 212 was off on its own. It had been joined to 211 at some point, but 211 looked as if it had long been burnt cinders by someone careless, carefree, and long gone. I had to pull a cloth over my face as I got close. Even with the door closed, the scent was absolutely unbearable. If I had to describe it briefly, it was the scent of fresh fruit. But I cannot describe it so quickly. The scent of fresh fruit with flies crawling over it, and over the tiny bodies of other flies no longer moving. Cups of instant noodles, half opened and uneaten, stacked one over another in an odd and almost geometric pattern. Clothes, neatly arranged, folded and washed, then thrown in towering piles that smelled too much of chemical disinfectant. And the faintest hint of something else. Something under the 200 chemical names that my brain didn't quite register. Her computer was on. And there was an internet window, crammed open with tabs. One set aside for emailing. The others crammed with increasingly implausible stories and urban legends. The final tab was a map of our city, with certain stores and areas listed in the find view direction. It looked as if she took the same route at least once every week. Despite the clutter, the room was otherwise spartan. There were three, three television sets, two of the newer plasma screens, and one older television set. All of them were turned on, and not a single one had a console hooked into it, and they were all displaying the same thing. Analog static. Right, my apologies. A few years back, some analog stations had empty channels. You turn them on, and get test patterns, white noise, and strange flickering stack that danced across the screen. Same with televisions not hooked up to anything. And I guess that was what was happening there. Or at least I did at first. One of the televisions went dead suddenly. My heart nearly beat out of my chest as a pop echoed throughout the room. And the older television set 
popped out a VHS tape. After catching my breath, I slid the tape back in and rewinded it for a moment. Then, a few more moments. Hours of analog static, painstakingly recorded. And when I checked the plasma screen discs, the same damn footage, recorded on higher definition formatting. Some part of me wanted to turn it off, but I didn't. The stench was getting to me, and I still hadn't found Norma. I wanted to give her the game, ask if she needed help. Really, it was like being a deer in the headlights. I couldn't turn back, and I was too frightened. And there was still one room left. I could only imagine it being the bedroom. If she slept on the couch in front of those constantly wailing television screens. I'm sorry. Just a few more minutes. The room was hallowed out inside. If you've ever been in the middle of one of those public park restrooms, the ones that have a giant, you know, the ones that have gigantic pits dug into the earth. That's what it reminded me of. Unlike the living room, this room smelled like nothing, safe plastic and something faint. Perfume, perhaps. Plastic and perfume. The reason for the former was the tower. I don't know how far down that hole must have gone, but rising out of its cavernous depths was a tower of cartridges, discs and systems. I don't know how they were interlocked, but it was... It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Thanks. I can continue now. Most of the games were recognizable. I could recognize a few that I had in my shop before. Common titles, the kinds you'd get buying a system with a game. Flagship things. And then, there were others. Bootlegs. Untitled games. Games that looked like they'd been made by one person alone in a computer science class to prove they could. All of them stacked on top of each other, and reaching towards the roof, as if the roof were heaven, and the grey spire might pierce into the sky and let itself go free. But it didn't, of course. It couldn't. It was just a stack of plastic cartridges and nothing more. There was a ladder, down into the pit. It was one of those iron flood ladders, the kind you ratchet to a surface. I climbed down it trepidatiously. It took me about 10 minutes to finally reach the end of the ladder and descend into the pit. Norma was there. She must have jumped from the top of the hole. Had she dug it herself? Did she found it? Her neck was bent, her eyes permanently locked up at the sky. For once, we actually locked eyes. I noticed for the first time how bloodshot they were, and quickly looked away. I... I know I shouldn't have. But her hand was outstretched. When she fell, I could only imagine that she'd fallen at such an angle that her hand was outstretched. Damn it. What was I supposed to do? I still had the game in my coat pocket. I took the cartridge out and placed it in her fingertips. And then... Then I closed the fingertips around the game. Her hand was still warm. There was no darkness in the light besides the pale stack of the television sets filtering from far above. Then... The door blew shut. And there was no light at all. But in that darkness... With only the pale, red, rusty pink writing I saw flicker across the walls. I swore I saw her smile. This time, it only took minutes to climb back up the ladder. My blood racing, as I felt I might have a heart attack and fall backwards. Backwards into the pit, and Norma's outstretched hand in the plastic pillar of flesh. But I made it out. I opened the door, and slammed it shut behind me. One of the tenants must have called the police or something, because there was a whole squadron of them waiting outside in the pale dawn light. 
I hadn't known how long I'd been there. But they stared at me expressionlessly. I knew a few of the officers involved. But they were all pale. As if there was something they knew that I didn't. I tried to ask for help, to explain what I'd seen, but they brushed past me. And there were others, dressed all in drab blacks, withered greys, and a few of the ones that looked more important had badges. And all I could remember was that they were green, painfully green. And in that pale light, it hurt too long to look at them. For a minute, I thought they'd assume I'd done something, you know, been responsible. But I was assured that there was nothing I could have done. There's no telling when seemingly ordinary people are crazy after all. It was too bad. Tragic even, but... I'd get help. Which is why I'm here talking to you, Doctor. The one thing that stays with me... And it's such a stupid thing. Is that I remember a few of the out-of-town officials pulling me aside before ushering me out of the crime scene and asking me, again and again, what I'd done with the game. I told them. I told them, but they didn't seem to believe me. Yeah, it isn't important. I just wish I could have done something to help her, Doctor. Roxetine? Sure, thank you. I'll turn in the prescription tomorrow. Like I said, she has it now. Last I saw. If you're willing to dive into that wretched pile and pry it loose, you could take it too. If it hasn't already been seized. I don't understand why you're asking though. I already told the truth to those fellows before. Thanks. Of course, I won't worry about it. The whole thing is too much for me, Doctor. Thanks for listening. I guess I'll see you around then. Thanks for sticking around to the end. And if you enjoyed today's story, make sure to leave a like. And if you want more like it, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you never miss a story. If you need more now, why not check out my Game Pass playlist? I'll leave that on this card, and I'll catch you in the next story.